This is Chris Goldthorpe with ChessChessChess.com. This video is for somewhat beginning players, maybe in the 1,000 to 1,200 range, who are uh, looking for a slightly more sophisticated way of uh, defending against D4. If you have a regular chess teacher, I would recommend to just follow whatever suggestion they give you, especially if they have seen your game. But uh, in the event that uh, you think you might be interested in the Grunfeld, then uh, this might serve as a introduction. So naturally, as you know, at lower levels, most games end because of horrific uh, tactical errors in the middle game. So we're going to uh, study this with that in mind. So, without further ado, let's get started. Let's suppose that uh, white plays d4, because that's what this whole video is about. In d4 openings, black wants to guard e4, so that's why you're going to see black either play the Dutch defense with f5, uh, or d5, or as here, knight f6, which is very flexible, though once you play knight f6, you're not going to be playing a stonewall formation or the Dutch defense. Now, this is most common, so we'll take a quick look at a few alternatives. But bear in mind, this video is not designed to uh, teach you about, for example, the Trompowski. I would recommend to make this move. Now, there are three main possibilities here. One is to move the bishop back to h4. One is to move back to f4. And there's even h4. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look at each of these in turn. Let's look at the uh, bishop h4 possibility. The idea there, of course, is to keep the bishop on the same diagonal as the black e-pawn so that it's pinned. Black doesn't want to move this pawn or he loses his queen. Um, I've seen g5 here, which is a pretty bold move. I don't know that I'd be anxious to, uh, to take that on, but it is uh, one of the possibilities there. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I think it's going to be simpler for you to go here just because of problems with your king side. And then bear in mind, again, I'm advising a player who is uh, still making tactical mistakes, so opening up the king side here could be dangerous. Knight d2, and black gets another piece out. White prepares to get the other bishop out, and c5. Uh, black wants to lay claim to the dark squares on the queen side because the queen side dark bishop is gone over on the other side. So d4 is not an exception. The queen will typically go to b6 where it adds its pressure to d4 and to b2. You have to be careful sometimes when you capture a pawn at b2, white can trap your queen. Uh, so let's look at... Um, another line instead of bishop h4 let's look at bishop f4 which is generally considered the main you know the most sane line uh, black again immediately starts hitting d4 and b2 f3 is a way of uh, attacking the knight uh, the queen can't go here right now, and even if it could, the bishop can see g3 as well. So, uh, there's this check. Uh, he could play c3 to block the check. And now black's knight is still in trouble, and the best he has is to back up. So this is a situation you might find yourself in. Now, of course... Since this is a video, you can write down whatever you like. You can stop the video at any time, and you can go back and play it over at any time. So in the interest of keeping this as short as it needs to be, we'll move on. 
Here's another opening called the London system. It's another system opening. Now you don't see this among grandmasters because they can afford to spend a lot of time on their openings and the time they spend on their openings is time well spent because they can transform a small advantage from the opening into a win. So it's relatively more important for them to uh, play the very sharpest opening moves. Uh, among amateur players, what's really more important is to just play a position you're familiar with. So this is an opening that White often chooses to uh, do, like I said, a system opening where they'll typically put the E pawn here and they might put this C pawn even on C3. Uh, the Knights will go to D2 and F3 and guard each other and the Bishop will go to D3 and the pawn will eventually come forward. Um, also, white will often move his queen over to b3. Doesn't mind trading queens with black if it doubles black's pawn. Um, and often can conclude with a kingside attack. So this opening certainly can be dangerous, but this video is not going to give you very much on it. I would recommend to just play d5. No need to panic. c3 c5 this is one thing black really wants to do when the dark squared bishop leaves the queen side uh, be sure to keep thinking about b2 you know knight c6 c5 and queen b6 all aim at d4 but b2 also should get some heat this is a maneuver black often does in completely closed positions where it may be worth three moves one, two, three, to capture the bishop uh, for a knight. Okay, now the queen can see d5. If white's not care and black's not careful, white can play b4 and b5 as black often does in some variations of the Slav. Uh, but black wanted to do this trade here. And now play e6. And um, this is not not a bad uh, not a bad situation for uh, for black. In fact, uh, yeah, black is is totally okay here. Nothing to worry about. Uh, let's see what other thing can white do that's a little bit offbeat. Um, this is an offbeat variation here too. Knight c3. This can lead to Verisov's opening. Which, I mean, if I were to play e6 and white played e4, I can just take the pawn there. Uh, yeah, then white can take back, because if I play knight takes knight, bishop takes queen. So, yeah, if e6, then d e4 by white transposes directly into a French defense. Um, white is probably a little more used to that than, than black is, but I would recommend to just go here. And then he has nothing really better than... Than this we could play here and uh, you know white has a tiny advantage here as white normally does because he got to move first but nothing to write home about now this is another thing white can do he can try to put his four centermost pawns all on dark squares this is called the stone wall he gets a big grip on e5 wants to bring the knight to e5 when it gets captured he captures back with the F pawn, castles on the king side and uses the rook on the F file. So um, play might continue like this. Black often wants to open the C file because white has not developed a piece on his second move and black is temporarily ahead on development. Two to one. Now he gets another piece out. 
and black moves a piece for the second time and that gets the queen out as well uh, this is certainly not terrible not even a little bad for black pretty good for black nothing to worry about you could be happy about this all right so um, this is by far the most common second move for white c4 now I hope everyone watching this not a good move for black I'm gonna cover it here just because I see beginning players make this often Nimzovich in his book my system discusses this uh, white should take in whichever way black takes back white will very soon gain a tempo if the knight takes back pretty soon white will be playing e4 and knocking it back if the queen takes white can play knight c3 so without being able to put the bishop here and aim down this diagonal as he can in the Grunfeld uh, it's not really good to play d5 here not uh, not at all okay so let's look at knight c3 uh, after what black plays g6 e6 is another move that that players play I mean this is not a bad move for black to place there. Uh, but since we're talking about the Grunfeld we're we have no need to discuss this uh, or the names of the openings that would come from that. G6 could lead to the King's Indian, but only at Black's uh, discretion. So since we're aimed at a Grunfeld, we don't need a, a big dissertation on the uh, King's Indian. Uh, Knight C3. Now, White could play some other moves, and, and Black could still aim for this Grunfeld, this d7 to d5 all in one move shot like this. And this is a cousin of the exchange variation, just transposing in the Fionchetto line. And we can drop back to here and look at few more moves, eight, knight, c3, knight, c6, e3, rook, e8, d5, knight, a5, knight, d4, knight, d7, I mean, bishop, d7. I mean, white does have a lot of space, but black has no real weaknesses, and uh, black is... Black is okay here. E4, C6. Very nearly equal. Uh, what if white plays this on the third move, right after you play G6? Let's say he plays G3. I would still go here. And then if takes, takes. And if knight C3, right back bishop to G7 again. So most often is knight to c3 because white is playing that move so that he can get e4 in. He could not get e4 in safely if the knight were not guarding e4 because this black knight on f6 would take the pawn. So after knight c3, now we got to this position like this. Knight here guarding e4, c4. And g6. And now, knight c3 is by far the most common, and this is where you elect the Grunfeld. Now, almost all the time, white plays this move, but there's a couple of other moves here, so we'll take a look at them first. Uh, one of them is knight f3, and black can just say, okay, I'll uh, just keep my pawn at d5. White could try to put greater pressure still on d5, similar to the so-called Moscow variation. Black does best to just go ahead and liquidate at that point. And then castle. White goes for the big center. And this knight goes to eight, a6. Now, it should be obvious where that knight is eventually going to 
come back into the game. I think he's going to come back on c7 after black plays c6. White gets ready to castle, and black plays all the way up to c5. Now, if he pushes that pawn, e5 right here becomes a useful square for black. Okay, so now black has a queenside majority, three against two, and some decent black squares in the center. He may even play knight g4 with the idea of following it with uh, knight e5 at some point. Black doesn't mind trading off pieces, especially knights, because he has less space. Okay, white is avoiding that trade, and black initiates it. Now, although this pawn on d5 is weak, because it's an isolated pawn, it does have a lot of protectors, and it is a passed pawn. Okay, black lets the other rook out and aims into the center, develops his last minor piece, as does white. Now we got two against one on this c5 pawn. Queen b6 guards that pawn and attacks b2, but it also has its indirect effect on d4. Uh, so that was the knight f3 variation, bishop g7. Queen b3, pawns trade, black castles, white plays e4, black plays knight a6, eighth move, white plays bishop e2, black plays c5, white plays d5, black plays e6, white castles, e takes d5, e takes d5, bishop to f5, bishop e3, Queen b6. Okay, let's look at this line. When you play d5, sometimes black likes to play this. Uh, this is a little annoying to play against when you're the black pieces. I always like to trade this knight for this bishop if I get the opportunity to. Uh, black likes to castle pretty soon. He may as well do that now that the dark square bishop is out. Sometimes you got to be careful your bishop doesn't get trapped if you take away its retreat route. Black really wants to break up the center here. He has both bishops, but he has less space. Uh, knight e4 is a move that could be tried here. Uh, but this is showing like it's better for white. And hmm. yeah, queen, queen a5 is a good line. I, I hope it's better than what the computer thinks it is, but a lot of times it is, especially against your, your opponent here. And then queen b3. Black is putting pressure on b7 and d5. Uh, if he had just taken the pawn, which kind of looks good, right? Black has an amazing shot here. See if you can find it. Black has a move which might appear ridiculous and actually wins material. He can take this. Because if the queen takes, check, check, takes, but he gets material back. Takes the rook, then attacks the queen. Queen goes there, and then white is able to keep checking forever, and the threefold uh, repetition will soon take place. Okay, so this brings us to the main line. This is what white normally does, and this is the very first one to get familiar with, the exchange Grunfeld. The knight comes up, and black is now ready to stick his bishop here immediately, and that's why e4 doesn't really hurt him so much. Okay, 
Now this is unguarded. This is a target. If a bishop were there, it'd be attacking both of them. So the bishop is lined up for it. The white d pawn's totally pinned. White gets this one out before the knight moves because the knight wa might want to go to e2 to avoid a pin by the bishop to the queen. c5, of course that pawn is pinned. Knight e2 so that bishop to g4 would not pin it as it would if it were on f3. Knight c6, we can see that black is building, building, building pressure on d4 with the bishop, the pawn, the knight, the queen. White goes bishop b3. Now, white move first, but he feels like he's defending here. Black castles, white castles. Pin that knight just to force the pawn to get in the way. Now the bishop here is unguarded. And black attacks the other bishop. So he takes it off the diagonal. And then black's going to make a trade here. He's again attacking a piece. So white takes back with what appears to be a strong pawn center. And we go back here. Now that looks kind of crazy at first because it looks like white can just go here. He can, but then he'll go here. What did he just take? The rook. Queen takes back, but there's no other piece to go in here. Yeah, yeah, the bishop wants to go there, but uh, I can just play f6. Black does it now. Now, this bishop on d3 is unguarded, so there's a pin along the d-file of the pawn. Goes here attacking the rook. Well, sure, he'll move him. The d pawn is still pinned. King gets out of the way. That takes this queen away from black, where he would go here check first. Rook c8. There's no hurry. There's no hurry here for black to move this bishop, because if white takes, black takes. Knight f4. Okay. Now he should back up. So he goes this way. He doesn't want to see bishop to b5 bothering his rook. Because if the bishop went to f7, then bishop to b5 over here leaves the rook unable to get itself away from bishops. This is, uh, this is not a bad position for black. So we'll take a look at this main line again. Seven, bishop c4, c5, knight e2, knight c6, bishop e3, castles, castles, bishop to g4, f3, knight a5, bishop d3, c takes d4, c takes d4, bishop e6, d5, Bishop takes the rook at a1. Queen takes the bishop at a1. f6. Bishop h6 hitting the rook. The rook moves. King h1. Rook c8. Bishop f. I mean knight f4 and bishop to d7. And this is fine for black. You should be happy with this. So now let's take a quick look at some some actual games here. Uh, this is a game between uh, Ge Gesseljen and Peter Fiddler as black. And um, it, of course, starts off as a Grunfeld, as that is our subject. This game was the exchange variation, and it seems to follow pretty normal paths. Now, he plays knight f3 first here, getting the knight out first. If you get the knight out first, you don't want to put on e2 because it'll block the bishop. So uh, I noticed this move disappeared for a while, then came back. White uh, hits the pawn. Now white's taken a slightly different path here, so every case is different, like the lawyer says. Knight 
c6. Again, the c3 pawn is still unguarded, so it cannot move or should not move. Bishop e3, but c3 is still unguarded. And bishop to g4. Black might even give up his bishop pair to get control of these dark center squares. Rook b1, at least the rook won't be won by capturing this pawn. And white trades. Black uh, white takes back with the pawn. <clears throat> it doesn't seem like the g file should be so useful for him, but with the bishop pair getting good control of the center, uh, could be scary for black. We have the advantage of already knowing how this game ends, but remember black didn't. C takes d4, c takes d4. And now uh, black has three pieces on d4. He's got the bishop, the queen, and the knight against two defenders. Um, let's see, there is a check here with the queen, but the queen already guards d4. So he takes, and white takes a pawn. Now he castles, white castles, and e6. That gives the knight a way to maneuver, and also the pawn doesn't have to be constantly uh, guarded. The queen and knight can go do other things. F4, as predicted, now this bishop is, is ready to come out, and these four pawns really do uh, control a bit of territory. Bishop takes e3. Black, uh, white's going to have doubled pawns anyway. And now black tries to get his remaining pieces. Now there are very few minor pieces left, so it's good to know that controlling the center doesn't mean a whole lot when the minor pieces disappear. Uh, queen c2, threatening the black knight. Black continues to develop. Rook b5, it's guarded by the bishop. It's attacking the queen. Queen goes to a3, threatening e3, as indicated, which would actually be a check as well. Queen b3, attacks the queen and guards it, and the queen comes back to e7. Black does not want to trade queens just yet because he has uh, really better pawns now. White, two of his pawns are isolated. Uh, there's only one pawn that isn't either doubled or isolated. Uh, out of black's five pawns, only one of them is isolated. E5, A6, attacking the rook. Rook B7, guarded by the queen. Queen C5, pinning the E pawn. Um, yeah, if the bishop were to take here, knight a5 would be very strong. Queen b6, trying to prompt him to trade queens. Uh, he still doesn't. Actually, it didn't seem all that bad of a decision at that point. Uh, queen b3, white seems to be dying to... Uh, to trade. Uh, so black is going to force a queen trade here. Takes and takes. And now he's going to just. Oh. He's going to go ahead and get a, a knight and a pawn for a rook. Takes, takes. And black resigns here. Black resigns? No, white resigns. How come I get to play black all white the time? Huh. That's yeah, where my rook belongs, too, too bad, on an open fire. This is well beyond the opening. All right, let's uh, look at another game. This one is between Wang Yu and Bessie. Haven't I told you you got to study opening theory? This one again starts off d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, going into the main uh, Grunfeld. 
White is hoping maybe for a uh, king's Indian because if black plays bishop g7, then his c3 knight guards e4 against the black knight on f6, and he can play e4. So black decides to uh, bust open the center right now before white can play e4. And in this game, he plays this bishop f4 line. So we get bishop g7. E3. Now the, the bishop beside the white king here is guarding this pawn because this pawn's not in the way anymore. C5. Black wants to bust these up while he has the bishops and while his bishop is on this nice diagonal. White takes and the queen goes over here. Queen A4 check. Um, this does not force a queen trade unless white wants the queen trade because black can put his, his knight at c6, but he decides to drag the white knight to the edge of the board. So now he attacks that knight, and the knight has to go back, and the other knight jumps in here to e4. That seems to leave d5 a little soft. And so white takes there with a threat to win the rook with a fork at c7. Knight a6, another piece comes out, guard c7. f3 puts the question to that knight, so this knight comes back and takes this. And um, white has a 3 to 2 majority on the queen side here, which often black does in these closed openings. And he castles long with the bishop aimed over there. Could get interesting. Rook c8, putting the rook on the same file as the white king. Bishop g5. Now uh, we have a threat here at e7. Black says, get out of here, Mr. Bishop. And he goes back this way. And then he moves his king up. Hmm, I guess there, you know, there's not a lot of open files, so he can get away with stuff like that. And he wants to get his rook out. Knight e2, e6. Uh, f6 here is guarded by both king and bishop, so the knight's going to have to take a hike. So back he goes. Now this bishop pins the e-pawn and threatens it. So white comes back and guards it. However, it is still pinned. E5. Now the light squared bishop is going to be able to go here. And of course the rook should not take it as the knight guards it. That knight cannot be too easily... Well, yeah, on B4, then this knight will take. Okay, king to B1. The king is no longer on the same diagonal as this bishop or the same file as this rook. Rook hd8, giving the bishop a little more support. e4, releasing his dark squared bishop. f5, black is going to uh, start to challenge that. He's also getting his pawns under light squares. Knight d4, or no, knight g3 was the next thing he did. With uh, a little more pressure here. B6. It's going to keep keep shoring things up here. There's no real threat here to white. He can take back with the pawn if he likes. Bishop B2. The other rook is now getting ready to come out. F4. Okay, goodbye, Mr. Knight. And that uh, blocks the rooks up. I don't know where this knight's coming back out. It'll take a while. Bishop F8. Strange looking move, but this black bishop's not going to be going anywhere along this diagonal, nor on this one, nor on this one, as this is closed and blocked. So, yeah, it's about the only piece he really needs to get into the action besides maybe this knight. A3, getting ready to play B4, apparently. Knight E6, eyeing up D4. Knight D2. 
coming back out, knight on A to C5. Yeah, we're going to move the center knight toward the middle. Knight D5, like we knew white would eventually do with these pawns here this way. Um, A5, that looks a little odd because he just left this unguarded. So are we to believe that this rook move takes care of everything? So he can move his knight away. No, he can't. The bishop can take it. All right, so he goes b4. They trade, so the knight still has to move, or we can attack the rook. So he saves the rook. Now the knight really needs to move. Oh, rook b8. Oh. If the pawn takes, then he goes pawn takes pawn with a check from the rook. No safe interposing. He would have to go to the A file. I still don't see that it's definitely worth it. Rook C3. Knight C4. Rook C3. No, Knight D4. Okay, I'm still not completely sold on why white doesn't take the knight with his pawn. We're attacking the rook for the time being. He comes over here to attack the bishop, guarded only by the knight. He guards the bishop. And white does take the knight. Now he takes the other pawn and attacks the rook. The rook backs up. And we're attacking the bishop, but we're also opening the diagonals for the bishop on c5. He takes the bait. He takes back with check. Ah, that's where he wins the bishop back. King goes. He takes his piece back. Uh, but we got rook takes bishop here, right? Yeah. So black has two rooks and a bishop. White has two rooks and two knights. That would seem to be good for white. Let's see what happens. He pins the knight, threatens the check. The knight trades. Now he's got a pair of pawns on the sixth rank. Wow. Knight c4. Rook on d to c8 pins the knight. Rook to d1. Rook to b3 guards the advanced pawn. Rook a7 check. King comes back where there are no more good checks. Uh, he comes back to guard the knight, but it looks like rook here check would be good. And white agrees and resigns here. Wow, really a, a powerful case of getting the pass pawns. Okay, we do have another game to look at. Uh, let's let's go to it real quickly, and let's see. That'll be over here. This is with Viswanath and Anand against Peter Lecko. They're both uh, 2,700 plus players. Anand, who's playing the black pieces here, is a former world champion. And this game, of course, begins with d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3. D5, the Grunfeld. Here white played knight f3 instead of playing the exchange variation or the bishop f4 variation. Uh, so, bishop g7 quickly. It's always, it's almost always a good move after you've already played d5, unless white is captured. Uh, queen b3, those moves sometimes come up in the opposite order. I think this has been called the Moscow variation takes, queen takes back, castles, and here white plays e4, and um, it looks like that pawn coming to e5 could be kind of menacing, because black doesn't really have a good square. Apparently he's, he's planning to bother the queen. Bishop e2, white's going to get castled, and... Wow, this almost looks like a Queen's Gambit accepted sort of pawn formation on the 
queen side for black takes takes and if you don't know what that is don't worry about it for now we'll discuss it later okay castles and takes that pawn white trades black still has the bishop pair comes out here and he uh, attacks the queen it's guarded by black's queen black queen moves and what knight d7 no he takes that pawn hmm comes to the center now the light squared bishop is pinned but white has no quick way to attack it again that makes sense he can't move this e2 bishop here okay guards it now he's ready to move his queen the knight comes in and black will attack that for the second time plus he's attacking the pawn on c5 Knight d3 attacks the bishop and guards this pawn. And the bishop comes back home, which is a good idea. With all of these pawns on white squares, black really needs to get this bishop where it's going to guard this. I wouldn't be too surprised to see if that moves good. Knight b4. Knight f6. If white trades, black will get this dark squared bishop so not a good idea rook c8 black really wants to get the dark squared bishop c6 not sure why that would be good oh his uh, bishop on f3 and his knight guard it queen a5 attacking the knight So the queen jumps into c5 here and um, guards the knight. White is going to damage the king side. And uh, he wants to move his bishop to f8. Look at this idea here. It will cause a problem. Bishop d6. Bishop f8 anyway. So takes, takes. Well, his only knight's over on the queen side. He doesn't have a dark squared bishop. I, I suppose black is safe enough over here. Goes to d6. If white were to win this game, it would be because of this pass pawn. Queen a3, pinning the knight. The white knight cannot give check. Rook d3, queen b2. Queen does have a place to get away. Again, it's good that the uh, black is getting into white's position. Rook b3, queen e2. And... Um, Black Queen doesn't have very many places where it can go and not be captured. But for now, F3 is guarded. Knight A6. Queen takes. Attacking both the Rook and the Knight. Let's see. What does White have up his sleeve? Because these are strong players. I bet it's Rook here. Yeah. Rook A3. Guarding the Knight. Attacking the Queen. Queen comes back and guards the b-pawn and escapes. White's wanting a queen trade. So, black says, okay, how are you going to keep guarding your c-pawn? Uh, let's see. Attack it. He goes here. And now he'll come back. Now the threat on the knight is real. So he guards it. Okay, if the rook attacks it again, and it does, now the pawn falls. And he doesn't want any checks there by the white rook going to d8. 
Let's see, one. White is still double guarding the pawn, but it's triple attack. But if the knight takes, he can move the other rook so that both of his white rooks are on the C file. Like that. You'll think I'm boasting, but I'm practically invincible with the white pieces. He will go here. And that might not be so good for black. So he cannot do that yet. So we play with d8. Knight to c4. Okay, black may have to sacrifice here. Now these players are strong enough that I'm quite certain that they've all considered all of this many moves ago. I predict he'll move his other rook to rook a to a8. Yeah. It's not going to help white get a queen. And the pawn is still blockaded and double attacked. Okay, Black, white naturally wants to trade pawns off because his pawn's not going anywhere. Okay, there's a check square, there's a check square. That attacks the knight. Uh, let's see, if knight takes and then the rook comes back here. If I were to push, and then he takes the knight. Yeah, it doesn't, the pawn doesn't quite make it, so he starts moving his king. Rook b3, his king's moving closer to that pawn. Now, he takes the pawn, so black can also take a pawn. The question is, is will he want to trade knights first? I say he will. Um, he didn't. Because he could have won the pawn either way. Uh, rook c3, king d6, b3 check, king d6. Oh, knight d5. Um, white seems to be allowing black to get closer and closer to the center. Rook c4 attacking that knight. So now pawn takes. White has a clear pass pawn. Yeah, this is winning for black. Rook goes here. d4. Rook to a8. C7, Rook F1, and now Black should be able to just keep going forward. Rook D8, F5, H4, Rook C1, check, King G2. If the king had moved to e2 instead, then it would be easy enough for black just to come over to this side, and he's going to get the h-pawn. Rook c6. He wants to put his king here. Rook e8. Oh, here's even better for him. Rook d8. Naturally, white knows better than the castle. Takes here. f4 check. E5, rook E8, rook E6. Come on, trade queens, trade queens. Obviously, he doesn't want to trade queens. Okay, so we start pushing the pawn. F3. Um, now it could be a mistake to push the pawn, as the rook would come back here and check, trade rooks, and then king here and. Let's see, does that even does that even win? Pawn pushes. The rook checks at d8. Rook d6. Rook takes d6 check. King takes d6. King e3. Yeah. I, 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 I suppose he has to come down around to... Uh, a1. That, 
that doesn't make it a whole lot of sense either. King c4. He could have played king d4 also, so, the, well, yeah, this, it makes no difference either way. Check. And it's clear enough that uh, White's going to move that pawn down there. going to okay so hopefully you're seeing those three wins by black and some of the basic opening theory which you can go back over with several times will work well as an introduction uh, certainly you should not think that this is a complete and comprehensive guide to the Grunfeld this is just to let you know what it is what white's main plays are against it and to see some games where you see some of the positional and tactical themes. Uh, of course, you're not going to remember everything, but uh, seeing it more than once will help you to remember more than seeing it only once. So, good luck in your chess. Again, this is Chris Goldthorpe from ChessChessChess.com. Good luck in your games. Thanks.